We're ready to get started. Today is September 26, 2017. That's, right. That's it. And I'm Marguerite Gong Hancock from the Computer History Museum, and I'm in the home of Frank Bonsall. And, and I'm we'll... Frank Bonsall in Maryland, in my home, Mantua Farm in Glendon, Maryland. Frank, it's such a uh, an honor and delight to be with you here today, interview. Well, thanks for coming. We want to talk about your life and your work, but we, since it's a very special opportunity to be with you in your home, can you tell us a little bit about where we are and your beginnings here in your home? Okay, well, I was born November 29th, 1936, and this was my home for most of my life. My father was from Maryland and my mother was from New England. Her name was Edith Bass. She was the daughter of Robert Perkins Bass who was governor of New Hampshire in 1912. And the Bass's home is in Peterborough, New Hampshire, which is in South Central New Hampshire. And somehow she got down here, met my father, and they were married in 1935. So, other than my time in the military, which was a six months active duty, and other than that, I, and, and my time at Princeton, I lived all my life here. Mark I have a younger brother who's three years younger to the day and I had a sister who was eight years younger and she unfortunately passed away a few years ago. Her home was across the street. She had one child, Clifford Ransom. I have three children and seven grandchildren. Uh, one of my children lives in New Canaan, Connecticut with her husband, uh, Jake Goodyear, and, and three children. So the others are close by. My daughter lives just down the, down the road and where I used to live. And uh, with Helen, my wife says, Helen, she's from New York. And we were married in 1962, May 5th. We've been married 55 years. So, I first went to work for a brokerage firm in Baltimore called Robert Garrett and & Sons. And that was in 1962. I graduated from Princeton in 1959. I was in the Army National Guard. I went to active duty in Fort Knox and Fort Bliss, Texas. That was six months. And then I uh, came back home and went to work for Robert Garrett and Sons. And I was in the training program and then became a registered rep to uh, do what's known as retail brokerage. Frank, before we get to the details about your early career, I wonder if we could spend a little bit more time about those, your early years growing up and your education, some of the influences on your life that shaped who you were, maybe part of your education or well, uh, teachers see. or family members that were role models or impacted you. Well, my father, he was a horse trader. And so we lived on this farm so he could have horses. And this still is a horse farm, but he was an active and quite successful horse trader. I decided not to go into that profession, but to go into business. And I was always very curious about business. I never went to business school or graduated from Princeton in 1959 and I got married in 62 and I went to work right after my marriage in May of 62 and 
That was at Robert Garrett and Sons. Now my upbringing here was on a farm, horse farm. And I rode ponies and horses in my youth. I still ride. You do? Yep. Hmm. I fox hunt. My father was master of foxhounds. I was master of foxhounds at the Greenspring Hounds next door. And so it's sort of been my blood to, uh, you know, ride. And my daughter, Adair, who's my middle child, she rides. Frank, my son, does not, nor does my youngest daughter, Polly. I mean, they rode a little bit in their youth, but they're not riding now. And as I said, I'm still riding hunters. And... Um, I enjoy it. I'm not as I'm not a thruster. I go in the second field, non-jumping field. So at my age, that's appropriate. <laughs> and um, so I'm very fortunate to have, have been uh, born and raised here. And then I went to. Uh, Calvert School here in Baltimore, and then Gilman School, and then Princeton. How did you decide Princeton? Well, Princeton has a, a very uh, good following from Baltimore. And my and the headmaster, Gilman, Henry Callard, thought it would be a good choice for me. So he went to the bat for me and endorsed me, and it was entirely his his endorsement that got me into Princeton. And I enjoyed myself for four years. I was a member of the Ivy Club on Prospect Street. And I majored in American Civilization. And uh, How did you decide that major? Oh, I don't know. I just wanted to know more about our country and, uh, you know, the history. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. And it was fine. I was an average student. I wasn't anything special, but I got through. And uh, then after I graduated in 55, I had I had to had my military obligation to fulfill and I joined the Army National Guard here in Maryland and they sent me to basic training down in uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky and then I went from Fort Knox to Fort Bliss, Texas and uh, that was six months and then I came back and I did National Guard meetings every now and again and so I got I was uh, had a early discharge and so I was free to go to work and as I said I was fascinated with business and the passion I had for trying to understand how business works and technology was the driving force behind new business and I was interested in that. So I'm not a technologist, but I am a pretty good judge of people. And in business, it's all about people. If the people are right, the business has a chance. If they're wrong, they're, it won't work. So the most critical part of that process is evaluating people who they are, where they come from, where they came from, wh why it is they want to do what they do, and you know, all that. So, and uh, so I, I uh, specialized in uh, small to medium public companies. And I would put clients' money, invest in that sector. And then as I progressed, I got to know the venture capital community who had started these companies. 
and brought them along so that until they became public. So I would call on the venture capital companies who backed these early stage companies to find out why they did it and who they are and how, how they feel about it and all the rest of it. Those were early days. Who Do you remember yeah. people that you were talking to or companies at the time? Well, I had a lot of companies I was talking to. I mean, I remember going up and visiting George Dorio at American Research and Development. Yes. And he was one of the early VC, VC companies. And he invited me to come with him to visit uh, Digital Equipment Corporation, hmm. Ken Olson. And what had happened was the night before one of the key employees of of DEC was assassinated by, the, uh, by a bullet through the through the uh, through the window of his home, hmm. and he went out to see how everything was, and I went along with him. You went with him to to DEC to, to digital deck. equipment in Maynard, Mass. Mm -hmm. So I climbed up the stairs to the mill which was the headquarters and I met Ken Olson and some other people and I became somewhat interested in that company which had gone public and so and then you know I, uh, American Research Development had a lot of other portfolio companies some of which was public like Cordis in Miami which was a uh, a, a pacemaker company and as a result of looking at Cordis I met I went to see Medtronic in Minneapolis mm. and uh, and so I did my own research although I read whatever research was available but I'd go to the companies and I'd talk to management and I'd try to you know, understand where they were and what they were doing, why they were doing it, where they were going. And if they became, if they were public, which is most all these companies were, I might, you know, invest in the companies for my clients and myself. Your, so, as, your yeah. as, astute assessment of people and companies has yeah. been legendary. What What kinds of Things did you look for? Questions did you ask as you were making your judgment? Well, you look for management that have a track record. If they're if they're first time around, there's a question of whether they can do do the job. So more than not, we look for management who had a track record of running companies prior to the, what they were doing, and. Um, you know, so you'd go talk to the management and you'd ask them why they're doing this and what they think the opportunity is. And, and if you feel that they were credible, you proceeded to look at the business and the markets they serve and try to ascertain what the opportunity was. So, and getting uh, familiar with the VCs who back these companies like American Research Development or like uh, Greylock or like Fidelity, or, you know, I, I mainly concentrated on East Coast companies because I didn't uh, want to travel. It was, California was the other place to go and I sort of stayed in the Northeast because in, in Boston, thanks to MIT and uh, Harvard, there was a lot of ac activity and that kept me busy. So um, I would only call on public companies because I was interested in the opportunity that presented itself from the possibility of investing in public companies, and mo most all of them were technology companies. 
Um, I'm not sure which ones did did the better, but um, you know, digital equipment certainly did quite well for many years. And then there was a lot of others. Uh, so what happened was, um, as a result of my talking to the VCs that had backed these companies, I became intrigued with the venture capital community and the opportunity that presented itself. And there were no VCs in Baltimore at the time. And I had the good fortune of talking to Chuck Newhall, who was at T. Rowe Price, run, running the New Horizons Fund. Maybe we could just take no. a break while the phone, so okay. that the phone isn't in the recording. I think Helen's upstairs. Okay. So the New Horizons Fund was a public mutual fund that they started that invested in emerging growth companies. And so I went out and visited those companies. And when I uh, transferred from Robert Garrett to Alex Brown in 1965, Alex Brown was a, a broker dealer and an investment banker. And I was working for Ben Grizzle, the senior partner, and I traveled abroad with him to visit investment managers, primarily in the UK and Switzerland. And that was institutional brokerage. But I migrated to corporate finance because of my interest in figuring out and participating in the IPO world. And so when I was able to um, uh, get a client that was wanted to go public and they chose Alex Brown to be the underwriter the first call I'd make would be to Chuck Newhall at, at T. Rowe Price and and ask him to look at the company that we were planning to take public. And many times he would uh, agree that there was a good opportunity and he would uh, buy shares on the IPO. So as a result of that, I got to know Chuck do you remember when you first, how you first connected, you and Chuck? Well, the T. Rowe Price is the largest money manager in Baltimore. And Chuck, along with a fellow called Cub Harvey, was running the New Horizon Fund, which was the fund focusing on emerging growth companies. So I got to know Chuck and Cub in the in the late 60s and I started with Brown in, in 65 and I was with them until we started NEA in 78 and as a result of trying to sell Chuck uh, shares in companies going public through Alex Brown I got to know him and I got to fig figure out that he also was interested in the venture capital business. And somehow his father was connected to the Rockefeller family. So he had some acquaintance with the venture business through the Rockefeller family. And it was his ambition to get into the venture capital business. And so he and I talked and decided that there might be an opportunity to form a new firm here in Baltimore, because there were none. 
And he talked to his peers at uh, T. Rowe Price, and they agreed to back us. They were our first institutional commitment. And I talked to my boss at, T at Alex Brown, and he was sympathetic but said they could not uh, invest because the money that they had in the firm had to be uh, deployed in the business, which was not venture capital, it was brokerage and underwriting. So I was not able to get Alex Brown to invest in what became NEA, but Chuck was able to get T. Rowe Price to agree to invest. And their um, investment was uh, subject to our finding a partner in California that had a track record in venture capital. So we both knew Dick Kramlick because he was uh, uh, involved when he was in Boston. Uh, I think it was with Welsh and Forbes or it was some family office. And then he got divorced from his first wife who had his two sons, Peter and Rex. And he decided to go to California because he responded to an ad that ended up being Arthur Rock. So when he moved to California, and I'm not sure when that was, he was with Arthur Rock. Well, of course, Arthur Rock was one of the original VCs in California. And he and Dick had been investing. It's primarily family money. And so Chuck and I approached Dick about the possibility of his joining us in a venture firm which Chuck called New Enterprise Associates and that was a so he worked for uh, New New Horizons so he he was the one that you know originated the name New Enterprise and uh, we were fortunate to uh, get Dick to join us in 1978 how did that conversation go when you were recruiting him? He was working in California with Arthur, and it was a, a big change for him to strike yeah, out with the, you. Well, he, you know, Arthur was uh, a control person. He was investing his money. And so Dick was working for Arthur, and Dick was not going to be in a position to enjoy the fruits of the investing as much as he would like. And the reason was because it was all Arthur Rock's money and he wanted to keep it for himself. So he was paying Dick a salary, but Dick didn't have, or he might have had a modest carried interest, but nothing of substance. So Dick was uh, incentivized to consider joining uh, NEA because we were in a position to offer him an equal share as founding general partner. And so after much deliberation, he committed to join us in, uh, in 1978. And uh, we did have the commitment from T. Rowe Price and so when he committed to us to join, we then went out and with the help of T. Rowe Price, uh, with introductions of people they knew, we were able to get in and talk to families uh, like the Ball family in Muncie, Indiana. We went out to see them and we talked to many other families and our first fund was 16.4 million. And it was in 1978. 
Then, of course, it was a question of performance, how we, how we did. And we had the good fortune of investing in companies that Dick had known, like Comerics and Wilbur Mass, and other companies that Dick knew, and some that Chuck and I knew of. And we uh, made, I think, about 1.5x return. Not bad and, for your first fund. And that was our first <laughs> fund. And then three years later, in 1981, we raised $35 million in our second fund. And then we grew it from there. We went from that to $125 million for Fund 3. And on the, on the course of time, we added... Neil Bond had been on our investment committee representing T. Rowe Price. And he decided that he wanted to join us in California because what happened was uh, Dick's wife had heart problems and she passed away. So Dick was out there by himself and Neil, he decided that he wanted to join Dick and become an equal partner with the with the with Chuck and I and Dick, which we did, and I forget what year that was, but Neil had been involved with us from the very beginning, thanks to T. Rowe Price's original commitment of a million dollars. So Neil moved to California because his wife Jody passed away also. And he and Dick were in the Rust building with Arthur Rock originally, because Arthur allowed them to stay in his office at, in the Rust building at 235 Montgomery Street. And so uh, after NEA, NEA 1, uh, we raised NEA 2, and that's when Neil joined us. When you think about those early, uh, when you um, think about the relationship and roles of you three, the original founders, how would you describe what each of you brought to the team? Well, I was the sorcerer. I, I, I was the one that was out in the field sourcing opportunities more than, um, more than Chuck and Dick. Um, and that was my propensity because of my background with Alex Brown soliciting IPO business. So I, I would uh, spend my time in the field looking at new companies and then I'd bring them to Chuck and Dick and we'd have meetings with the management and then we'd decide whether we wanted to pursue an investment with the company or not. And uh, Chuck and Dick's propensity was more operations. So they would go on the boards and, and these companies we invested in. I, I, I was the sourcer and they were the operating one. So they, they came in and looked at these opportunities from the point of view of being involved in the operations as a director of the company. And uh, so we invested in, in, I forget, in the first fund, maybe half a dozen companies, and the second fund, maybe two dozen companies. So of those half dozen, what would you estimate? How many other opportunities did you source or examine before you selected oh, those say, very first I'd six? Say many, many, many. You know, because we tried to be very selective. Mm -hmm. So we looked at a lot of opportunities, and we turned down most of them. And we made mistakes along the way. Maybe we could talk a little bit about that. It's it's great to talk about the successes, but it's it's great for young. Well, you know, Arthur Rock was the founder of Apple Computer. 
Now, we never really had an opportunity to invest in Apple, but we knew about Apple, thanks to Arthur Rock. And I say that one of our mistakes was not not investing in Apple, because on, on the course of the time we were with NEA, Apple did raise outside money. And obviously, had we participated in that, it turned out that we had a, a Dick had a friend in London called Anthony Montague that ran a f fund called Abingworth, and that he, thanks to Dick, having introduced him to Arthur, uh, invested in Apple. And how it worked was. Uh, uh, um, he found that, uh, what's his name, Frank Wozniak, who was one of the founders. And Anthony struck a deal with Woz to buy some of his shares. Oh, so he bought some of Steve Wozniak's early shares yes, then? Yes, yes. And um, Steve Wozniak offered Dick the opportunity to invest alongside him, and uh, uh, Dick and I accepted and participated along with uh, Abbeyworth, and that was from a personal point of view. Uh, that was before actually we started NEA, because mm -hmm. had NEA been in existence, we would have invested for NEA. So we were familiar with Apple early days, but we never did have an opportunity to invest in Apple for NEA. We, we individually uh, participated in the good fortunes of Apple. And I remember once being in Sun Valley with Peter Crisp, who was on the board of Apple because he was at Venrock. And we had a snowstorm, and that morning we went out and we ma we made an apple out of the fresh snow, <laughs> and had a picture taken of of the two of us. Uh, uh, Chuck wasn't there, but it was uh, uh, Dick and myself. And uh, I'd like to see that picture. Anyway, I don't know where it is, but anyway, it was rather amusing. That was early days in Apple. Did you have a sense at what Apple might become? Those we are... really didn't. You... It was a wing and a prayer. Yeah. Um, what did you think of these sort of upstart people, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak? Were... I never knew Steve Jobs. I, I knew mm. Steve Wozniak, but um, we didn't know. We figured that it was worth a shot. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, and it was before NEA got started. So uh, uh, we had the good fortune, and of course we s sold the shares shortly after it went public. And I had the good fortune of building the Apple Wing down at uh, the house that my daughter's in now. And that Apple Wing consisted of a pool and a pool house and a new kitchen. So. It was very fortuitous that we had that uh, we, that we did invest in. It, it gave me the wherewithal to do what I couldn't do otherwise. So I was very grateful to uh, our, our, our friend in uh, London. And um, so when we started NEA, we did do a lot of co-investing with Abingworth. And uh, we didn't do anything with, uh, well, there was one company with Arthur Rock, I forget the name of it. And it, we did invest, but we, it didn't turn out it, all that well. I think we made a little money. Forget the name of it, but anyway. Since NEA was a relatively, uh, it was a newcomer it on was, the scene, Yeah. How, how was the environment you were New from Baltimore, and there were things happening in California, Boston. 
Can you provide well, we a little took, context you know, we took, for the industry we took, at the time? T. Rowe Price's advice by getting a partner on the ground in California. And in those days, most of the opportunities were in California. There was some in New England. Um, but being in Baltimore was a disadvantage because there wasn't anything in Baltimore to look at. And so we had to travel to New England and to California. And we went to see all the companies that, you know, that we were considering investing in. And we had to have a consensus to, amongst the three of us to invest. How did that work? Three very different people with different strengths. How did you well, we, you know, come to consensus? We, 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 we would have to have a consensus. We would have to go visit the companies or have the companies come visit us and we'd all three have to agree. If one of us didn't, we wouldn't do it. Hmm. We wanted to have, you know, have a majority. Later in life, it, it was you know, different because uh, we grew from having three GPs to having four GPs, and then later on we added, uh, we, we had Arthur Marks, who was, I think, the, f the fifth GP, because I had made some investments in software companies. And my partners knew that I didn't really know anything about software. <laughs> I invested in uh, data language that became Progress Software mm -hmm. with Joe Alsop. And I invested in SoftSwitch. And so my partners thought that it would be helpful to have a partner that knew software and we they we we all knew Arthur Marks, who had been with UCell, which was a software company in Rockville, and so we convinced him to join in as a general partner, probably five years after we had started. So that was in um, the early '80s, probably '81 or two. And um, so we then raised the fund too, and that fund also was successful. I forget the absolute return, but it was it was good enough to f say that we were gradually developing a track record. And in actual fact, during my time at NEA, the only down fund was NEA 9. So we went from 16.4 million to 35 to 125, then 250. And um, obviously, as the firm grew, we needed to build a, a back office. So we brought in a lady here in Baltimore called Nancy Dorman. And she was very instrumental in building up the administration of, of the funds so that we had, quote, a back office. And um, she did us an outstanding job. So with, the, with her coming in and with Dick on the West Coast, Chuck and I here, and then Neil transferring to the West Coast, we built a team and, and, and in order to be successful in the venture business, you have to have a team. You can't be a one-man bandit like Arthur Rock if you're taking other people's money. If you're just investing your own money, then that's okay. But obviously we needed to raise money from other sources, so we went out and talked to lots of different people and uh, there was a group in New York called Landmark. And a f lawyer called Peter Berg had set that up for the, Deere, for the heirs of John Deere. 
and we call them the Deer Girls. <laughs> and they had a family office on 55th Street in New York. And the guy running it, well, it was Peter Berg, but the other fellows were Howie Wolf and Mike Muneer and Earl Sampson. And so we went up and pitched them, and they came in as a major investor in Fund 3. And uh, and then Howie Wolf uh, was on our investment committee, along with um, Cub Harvey from T. Rowe Price. And I think the Ball family had somebody but um, so we were building, a, you know, a firm that had investment depth on the investment side and also on the administration side. And Nancy Dorman hired people here locally. The, the administration was always here in Baltimore. And uh, so then, uh, I guess about five years from the initial, uh, we did NEA 4, which was about $250 million. And so all along we had some success, double digit returns. I, I don't recall the exact numbers. And um, the last fund that I participated in was NEA 10, because by the time it grew from, you know, early, early days with the with the, the three of us, and then we grew it in nineteen in two thousand and three. When I retired, we just raised a billion some dollars for NEA ten. Remarkable. And. Um, I thought that 25 years into it was was enough, and to be perfectly honest, the dynamics of the business had changed because we had gotten so big. We went from three people to six people to where it is now, over 90, and of course you needed you needed to, you know, to have some mass, but I never really agreed with getting that big, and I think small is better. And if I had to do it over again, I would not encourage my partners to grow it to that size, because I just think it's too big. There are too many of you. It's hard to make decisions. We just had a consensus rule. We didn't have a majority. We did that we had originally. It be, it became a consensus thing, and uh, we'd have to have the majority, but not you know it wasn't 100 percent. So it was impossible to have everybody look at everything. So I think that the mistake that we made while I was there was to have it get so big. And if I had to do it over again, I would say, let's, let's keep it at no more than six general partners and let's not invest, let's not raise more than half, half a, you know, 500 million at any one fund. Because mm -hmm. I think having too much money gave us the impetus to do things that we might not have ordinarily done, like some leverage buyouts and whatever. And I can't remember what they were, but I, I know that over the course of time we made some mistakes. And of course they hurt. They hurt because they reduced the returns. And But you know, other than NEA 10, in my, in my tenure at NEA, we made money in all the funds other than NEA 9. Now, I had left before NEA 10 started investing. I, I was, I, I have a, a small carried interest 
in 10 having been involved with the fundraising but the carried interest it it, it uh, uh, how do you say it, it accrues based on the time you are with with the firm and mm -hmm. so you know I think after five years it, it's fully vested but I left about a year into NEA 10 in, in 2003 but today the firm uh, I think is on NEA 18 and I'm not real sure because I'm not involved I think 16 was just just closed in June okay, with 3.3 billion. All right. All right. <laughs> so I was there with through 10, and then they closed recently on on 16 at 3.3 billion. And they have a lot of new names, new new faces, and I don't know who they are. I know Scott Sandell is now the managing partner. Yes. And I know that Chuck stepped down, and Dick is. Uh, of counsel, but he's not a GP, and uh, he's actually started a new fund called Green Bay Ventures. Um, when you look back at NEA and its early years and how it evolved, did you have a conscious set of principles or values or culture that you try to inculcate that would define the firm? Well. No, I don't think so. We, 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 all we wanted to do was to make money. We weren't trying to create anything other than have success with our investments. There wasn't any additional uh, motivation, you know. We were paid a base salary and we had carried interest in the profits. And so we were, we were doing it mostly for the carried interest which over time amounted to a fair amount. And I, I had the good fortune of putting my carried interest in a family trust. And so that trust today uh, that I created uh, was the beneficiary of my carried interest. The early funds accrued to me, but the later funds, everything went to the to the family trust. And today that's about a $60 million trust. And I have three independent trustees that run it. And they hire money managers to invest the money. And they don't invest in venture. They just invest through money managers in public stocks. And so, you know, that, that those assets are not in my estate and the beneficiaries of my children and grandchildren. And so, you know, my efforts, I think, are, 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 are very good in the sense that my children and grandchildren will be well looked after. Yes. The and generations of, that you've impacted of your family. Yeah, generation skipping trust. So, so we had good counsel from uh, Dick Testa, of, uh, Testa Hurwitz, and then he passed on, and then Dan Finkelman of Testa Hurwitz, and he's now retired, so I'm not sure who they use. Um, that brings in an important element. You've mentioned different firms that uh, were involved and people in the back office. Now you're people of counsel. Were there other people or companies that were supportive in NEA being established and growing that were outside well, of the firm? Well, just our investors, primarily investors. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Nobody else. No, I, I would say it was very close in. You know, but as our network of investors expanded, we 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 had opportunities coming to us through them, and that was helpful. Um, so you know, uh, as I said before, I think there's a lot to be fed to be said for staying small. 
or not I mean you have to have critical mass you can't be just the new kid on the block and hope that you're going to see the opportunities you got to have an, enough uh, capital to have people come to you and not come to others and uh, of course you we always want good co-investors we generally don't want to be the only investor because we like to talk to our co-investors were there certain partners or other venture firms that you particularly like well, partnering with well we we, we liked uh, Greylock they were in Boston Bill Elfers and Dan Gregory and Charlie Waite um, and Dick had a lot of people on the West Coast that we got to know through him. Um, but no, there were no, there was no uh, particular fun that we liked more than the, another. Uh, we, we we were willing to talk to all of them. And of course, when you have success with one, you're apt to go back to that one, as opposed to going to somebody else, because you have a track record. NA, NEA was one of the few firms that really had a truly bi-coastal uh, presence. Yeah, that was important. Say more uh, about why you think that was important, how well, that Well, because, you know, California is a hotbed of activity for new companies. And without a presence in California, I don't think we would have done anywhere near as well. First, we would not have had T. Rowe Price as an investor because they insisted that we have a West Coast partner. And we got Dick Cramley because we knew him. Um, and I would say that over the life of NEA, of the 25 years I was there, about 80% of the companies we invested in were on the West Coast. I mean, we had the, uh, quite a number in the Boston area. Um, and then along the t way, we had Merck Pharmaceutical as a, as a partner. And there was a guy, the head of R&D there, called Lou Surratt. And they were instrumental in introducing us to Immunex, which we invested in that subsequently got acquired by Amgen. That company was in Seattle. But, uh, it, you know, Merck was a limited partner that added substantial value through their introduction to Immunex and to other biotech companies. So. We've talked about the firm growing. I'd like to turn now to some of the companies that you invested in and maybe some of the relationships that you had with those CEOs. Uh, um, how did you? Well, I think the, 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 my relationship with Joe Alsop, who was the founder of data language that became Progress Software was instrumental in substantial success because of our investment. And that happened because my Aunt Joanne Bross was friendly with Joe Alsop's mother who was in Washington and my Aunt Joanne lived in McLean, Virginia and they, and, and Joe's mother mentioned to Joanne that her son Joe was in Dallas and he was into and was taking a move into Boston to start a new software company and so as a result of that we met Joe and that led to the investment in Progress Software um, and that was fortuitous uh, not many came that way most of them were, <laughs> were direct you know uh, not through your aunt <laughs> no, that's the only one that I can recall that came that way. Uh, but, you know, we 
had Abingworth as a co-investor and they brought deals to us. Um, and there were other co-investors that brought deals to us. And we originated the majority of the of the investments and then we brought in co-investors. As you think about the firms that you and led the investments on, um, are there any that stand out in your mind that you're you think were significant or that you're particularly proud of? Well, I, uh, I was uh, obviously um, happy about Progress Software. Uh, Immunex, I forget who we brought in, but that was very successful. Uh, Softwitch, Softwitch was successful. Um, and obviously there were some that weren't successful, but I don't recall. Um, most of the most of them were on the West Coast. They were led by Dick Kramlick and Neil Bond, and I forget the details of what what they were. It's been some time, you know, fifteen years since I was with the firm, and subsequently from retiring from NEA, I was asked to join a family office here in Baltimore called Red Abbey, which are two brothers, Christopher and Philip Golett. And their, their family office is in New York, Golett LLC. And there's a lady there called Courtney Bass who takes care of their private equity. And we had some co-investments with them. Uh, what's what's were, the focus of Red App? <coughs> Excuse me, Red Abbey. Well, it's primary health care. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Philip is a is a doctor. He got a doctor from Cambridge University, and um, he looks at a lot of you know biotech startups, and he's incubating some companies on his own through his incubator called Acidophil. And one is an ag chem company called Agrometis, which I've invested in personally, and NEA's not invested in that. Um, and he's had a couple of others. We had, uh, let's see, we've started a, Red Abbey's started a, a group called High Cape in Westport, Connecticut, which is a guy called Kevin Rakin. And when I joined Red Abbey, we decided to raise a small fund called Red Abbey Venture Partners, and we hired a guy from Lake Mason called Matt Zuga to run it. And, Matt, and that fund was about a 1.4x it was a forty million dollar fund, and we have not raised another venture fund, but we have raised fund of funds, Red Abbey Capital Partners, which invests in other funds, early stage funds, and uh, we had success with one on, in California called Emergence Capital Partners. And they invested in a company called Viva Systems. It's been a very, very successful SaaS software company. And uh, we haven't invested in any funds locally, but most of the ones we've invested in are Boston, California. And we're not involved in the decision making. They're strictly passive investments. And we're on 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 Red Abbey Capital Partners too. And gen and 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 they generally are six to eight million, and it's all money internally. The Golette family being the largest, mm -hmm. and all of us individually having having a modest interest. And nothing, you know. I mean, Emergence has been our best fund, but. There, there are quite a few others that look promising, but it's too early to tell. So Frank, as you look back at your 
lifetime, really it's a lifetime of being involved with venture all the way back to your early days in Alex and Brown NEA and now through these Red Abbey and Fund of Funds. Right. How would you describe the changes in the venture industry here in the United States? What's been well, sort of Well, obviously it got bigger. I mean, and that's both good and bad. On the, uh, on the good side the first? The good side is that you, you're able to lead investments that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do. So being big, you can, you can lead or co-lead. Uh, most of the time, that's, a, that's an asset because then you control the destiny of the, of the, invest, of the investment. Um, because if you're small, you're just a co-investor and you don't have much influence. Um, so the good part is being big, you can be a lead or co-lead. And but that requires expertise and time and time, you know. And uh, time is the critical element of venture investing. You, you just have to have the, the time to source good deals and to work at those deals. And it's time intensive. And, um, you know, being a passive investor is not ideal. It's much better to be active and be a lead or co-lead. So that's the main asset of being big, and like on, NEA. And on the on the downside? Well, the downside is there's a lot of pressure on you to perform. And, you know, if you don't, it's a, a big, big hit. I mean, you, you, you want to avoid those, <laughs> you know. We had a company, I forget the name of it, but it was a personal computer company that didn't work, and that was, that hurt. You know, the biggest problem about being a lead is if you invest as a lead or co-lead, you're sort of obligated to continue. And if it's not working, it's very hard to say no. Uh, you're apt to put good money after bad. And that's not good. With those kind of pressures, um, how did you make those hard decisions so that you were of making the well, most of your investment Well, it was helpful money? to have partners help you make those decisions. If you're there by yourself, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not as easy. So having partners, you know, look at opportunities with you and, and, give, and, and to get advice is helpful. To be a loner in this venture business is, is difficult, you know, because it, you, the decision is entirely on you. It's much better to have partners and make collective decisions. And you can't have partners unless you have, you know, assets, because you can't pay, pay, pay partners unless you have assets that, you know, where you can get a management fee. So I don't know. It's a, it's a fine line to be, to, 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 to decide just how big. You know, you have to be bigger, but I never thought we should be as big as we, as we became. And I'm probably wrong. I hope I'm wrong. <laughs> Time will tell. Yeah. How, how about? straddling or balancing the demands between your investors and your entrepreneurs as you're you're trying to well you spend most of your time with the entrepreneurs because mm -hmm. that's where the critical mass is and you tell your investors what you're doing and you ask them for advice sometimes they can help but the investors are looking to you to make the decisions as what to back and what not to back. You're not looking to the investors to 
help you make those decisions. You've got to make them on your own. You mentioned that you're not a technologist, and yet you, <clears throat> you through your investments and through NEA, was really involved in a lot of path-breaking technology change. Um, yeah, but as I said, my main focus is people. Yes. And I, I try to decide about whether to invest or not based on my assessment of the people. If I feel good, I don't necessarily have to understand the technology that we're considering. But if I think the people that do understand, then I'm more inclined to invest. If they don't, I obviously wouldn't invest. Sure. There's that common question, and you as a horse person may have heard it, I'm sure, many times. Do you invest in the jockey or the horse? It's mainly the horse. Hmm. The jockey is the passenger. Hmm. If the horse doesn't have the talent, you're not going to win races. Hmm. The jockey can help, mm -hmm. but he's not going to make the horse win if the horse doesn't have the talent. So it's the management of the companies that really critical. Uh, as you look at people who are involved or entering the venture business today, it's very different from your experience. What advice would you have? You've talked about be careful of growing too large. What other kinds of advice that you might give to well, a... Well, the question is, what, does, what do these people bring to the table? What is their value add? To be honest with you, if it was just us doing it over today, I'm not sure it would work. Hmm because I'm not sure we today bring as much to the table as you need to be successful. Because mm -hmm. today things are more complex. And uh, so, you know, uh, this social networking business is a complex business and yet it's gonna be big. Artificial intelligence is going to be big. But how do you invest in those, in those sectors? You have to have the management to, you know, orchestrate the opportunity and to, and to implement the strategy to, to be successful. It's not easy. But if you have the right people, you got a chance. Doesn't mean it's going to work, but it, you have a chance. If you got the wrong people, you got no chance. So the critical element for me is judgment, judging the people. You've and been involved with this business here in Baltimore. You mentioned your time in Boston, and so you've seen this dynamic change of these different hubs. Do you care to comment on how those are evolving over time, the rise and fall of, of uh, Silicon Valley or Boston or what's happened in the United States compared to other places around the world? Well, I've been intrigued about Europe and India and uh, and the reason is, is that there's talent over there, but there's a lack of experienced talent. And so I found it very difficult to invest abroad. And I'm apt to avoid that just because it's, it's too difficult. I mean, here in the United States, we have more of a resource to call on. You know, if, some, if somebody's not up to the job, you can fire them and hire somebody to take the place of that person. It's not very easy to do that abroad. Um, 
there are opportunities, but they're hard to find, and we don't spend a lot. We didn't spend a lot of time looking at them. We spent our time here. It's good to be accessible to the management team so that they can talk to you and you can talk to them. And if they're in India or Europe, it's, it's, it's difficult. So we were apt not to do that. Well, that'll change over time. You know. You mentioned that you had a very early interest in business and you have devoted your life to building businesses. Right. I didn't uh, have a chance to ask you, but do you remember what was the genesis of that very early interest in business? I think it's just a curiosity thing. I mean, you're intrigued because you know there's there's opportunity and risk and you try to assess it. But clearly the biggest reason for being interested is the opportunity. If it, if it wasn't an opportunity, it wouldn't do it. You know, the opportunity to create value in, in frontiers of technology, it's, it's, it's large, but it's risky. So you have to be able to evaluate the risk. And sometimes it's very difficult, particularly early on when there's not enough to really put your arms around. But, um, you know, here in Baltimore, there's more, more, more opportunity than there was when we started because there's incubators here Betamore has spawned a number of companies, uh, some of which look to be successful, like Zero Fox and Red Owl looked to be successful, but was recently acquired by Raytheon. It it didn't work out as well as we'd hoped, um, but because of Hopkins in Maryland, there's more more opportunity here than there was when we started. So it's well worth, you know, spending some time locally. And I, 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 I work with my son, Frank, on education, because he is an educator. And there's a lot of uh, differentiation in, you know, what's happening in education. There's a lot of activity, and um, can you describe a little bit more about your your work in that area? Well, it's mostly because my son Frank understands it. He 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 is an educator. Uh, I mean, he went to uh, business school, and he understands the business. Uh, you know, there have been some companies like Capella mm -hmm. and uh, others that have, have been successful. We have quite a few investments in Boston. We have something called Better Lesson, and, uh, and we have some other companies uh, locally that I rely mostly on him. This. This is me personally. This had nothing to do with NEA. Mm -hmm. But I, I want to be responsive to my son's um, interest in working with early stage education companies. Because Sylvan Learning was very successful. That was here in Baltimore, but we had nothing to do with that. And out of that has come Laureate Education, which recently went public. And that was largely due to the Becker brothers, Eric and Doug Becker, who had their own fund called Sterling Venture Partners. And NEA did not invest in any of those companies. So. 
in this current chapter of your life, it sounds like you're in, involved in uh, investing in different ways. Are there other areas that you would like to mention here for the record? Things that you're not really no okay no. As you reflect back and uh, think of the sort of turning points of your life, is there anything that we've we've missed that you want to share? Well, I'm sure we have missed things up, but I can't I I can't put my finger on them right now. Okay. Your um, impact has been in many areas, and um, certainly on the venture industry. And as if you were to give some advice to a young entrepreneur as if they were coming to you, is there something that you would, what word of advice would you share for them, somebody who's starting out new? Well, the main thing is to be careful about picking the right partner. Because if you pick the wrong partner, it leads to a lot of complications. So you need to have somebody that understands what it is you want to do and is supportive um, but not necessarily a control person you know let management make the decisions just give them advice but if you're getting advice from the wrong people then you may be going to suffer you know so my advice to young entrepreneurs is to pick the right partner. Do research on what venture firms have been successful in the sector that you propose to go in and and try to, you know, approach them and, and see if they can be helpful and invest. Um, because experience is important. And uh, if you can find some venture firm that has a track record in a certain sector, that uh, that would be helpful. Green fields are difficult, you know, because you just don't know. So I think experience hel is helpful. Uh, and. Uh, in my case, I don't have any necessary um, edge on any particular technology. My, my expertise is judging the people. And I look to other people to opine on the technology. So I'm not a technologist, I'm a people person. I see that in your life as a testament to that. So, yeah, I'm pretty good. Some people think about how do you measure success when you look at the impact of your your life and your work. Yeah, well, that's, you? that that can be measured based on the success of the companies you backed, you know, and. Um, Sometimes companies need to move on, you know, you get to a certain point and they run out of gas, so you've got to find a way to move, move them up by merging with another company. That's not an easy conversation to have. No, but, you know... How did you convince management to do that? Well, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Either they can perform or they can't. And if they can't, you got to do something about it. You get, you just can't sit there and do nothing. So a lot of times they'll look at you for advice as to what you should do or sh or not or or not you know what you should not do. Sometimes uh, merging would is not the right out, the, the right outcome, but a lot of times it is. You know, you don't want to build a temple, you want to build a company <laughs> that is successful. And uh, if it's not successful, then you got to do something about it. And the last resort is to shut it down. 
But a lot of times, if it's not working, it's best to shut it down to limit, you know, your downside. Because if you continue to pour money at something that's not working, it's not a good idea. And that's a tough decision. And it's best to have a collective decision rather than an individual decision. Consensus is better than just just doing it by yourself, so to speak. But sometimes intuition is the best. You know, if you if you intuit, if if you feel good about something, the management should be able to work it out. What happens if the what hap would happen when the management couldn't and you needed to change the team? Well, then you have to find a way out, either to sell the company or bring in new management, mm -hmm. and that's not easy. You're in trouble. How did you do that? You're such a people person. How did you? Help well, you navigate have to make that? a decision as to whether the management is going to be up to doing what they what they have to do or not. And if you find that they can't do it, then you got to make a change. And you try to get them to support that. Because if they don't support it, it's all over. But the important thing is to uh, is to make a decision as to what and wh what and when that needs to happen. You can't do it in the abstract. Proof of the pudding is in the eating. If it's working, you go for it. If it's not working, you need to figure out why and do something about it. Sometimes it it means shutting down the the enterprise, and that's the last resort. So you can put a little money behind something, and if it's not working, you can cut your losses. But if you're, you know, deep into it, you want to try to make it work. You don't want to continue to feed something that's not working. It's hard to make those decisions. Did you ever, what were the kind of things that kept you up at night or that you really uh, worried oh my, about in those I, decisions? I'm, I'm rumoring, at night I'm, Rumorating in my sleep about all kinds of things. <laughs> There's no end to that. That's why I don't get very much sleep. Because, uh, you know, those things, they, they, they continue to uh, eat their way into your thoughts, it's, you know, whether it's when you're awake or, or asleep. Sometimes I make my best decisions that when I'm asleep. I wake up and say, by God, that might be all right. <laughs> uh, so I don't know. It varies. But the key is to have good people and good partners. Well, I'd like to close uh, with just any final thoughts on NEA. Speaking of good people and partners, you started that firm with just the three of you. Yep. Well, Would I'm very proud of the fact that the firm has done so well. And I'm grateful for what it did for me and what I did for them. And I'm just hoping that it will continue. And I think there's some very good people at the firm who I don't know, but pr presumably they do know what they're doing. And if they do know what they're doing, the chances are they will have continued success. If they don't, then it's not going to be good. It, it, you know, something will, will have to be rectified. I worry about the fact that they've gotten so big, that they've raised so much money and they got so many people. Because I, I think being 
focused and small is better. And that's why I'm more than happy not to be involved. Um, because I can get involved in s smaller funds that I think are doing it the right way. I'm not saying it's wrong, because it's up to them to make it right. But I would be apprehensive about making it right, because it's a tough challenge to run large sums of money with a lot of people. But I think they, they so far, so good. I don't know what the returns have been in later funds. So I think it's too early to tell on some of them, and I'm not familiar with them, uh, so I can't, I can't opine. Uh, it'd be interesting to see uh, what's the good, bad, and the ugly. Well, with that, the good, bad, and ugly, I think that's for a, a good place for us to end. I want to thank you so much, Frank, My for the conversation. Very, very nice of you to story. come see me, and um, I appreciate your, uh, your time and your... Uh, insightfulness and the questions that you uh, asked me. Uh, I hope I made a, a, a proper a proper response. It's been a real privilege. We're honored to have you part of our collection. Thank you. So thank you.